at you guys. It's your old pal Gizzo here, and we're having a clearance sale on my second and third book, Unhappy Endings and Angst for the Memories. We're now selling these for 25% off right now at jizzypearl.net. So go check them out. I'm slashing the prices. I'm slashing the prices. I'm totally nuts. I don't know what I'm doing. 25% off clearance sale at jizzypearl.net. All right, we are here, Chizzo Chats, uh, with my good buddy, Rudy Sarzo. Chizzo, I am more than your good buddy. You are my compadre. Compadre. We hang out on the road, we do all the uh, crazy stuff together and get up on stage and bang our heads. Yeah. Playing together for about a year? Has it been? Well, I mean, solid. I, I started playing with you guys like around October, and but solid bookings that started after Mohegan, which is right. February, March. Yeah, so it's, it's only been a few months, really. Yeah, yeah but uh, I feel like we know each other a little bit yeah. better. And um, yeah. Yeah. you're here to talk about your yes. book, Off the Rails, and my book, uh, that's right. Here's yeah. The cover. Yeah, here's the my cover. Book. The cover's missing. I don't know if the viewers can actually tell, but my, my book, it got soaked in the rain. You <laughs> gave me the book and we were on the road. And I, I put it in my suitcase. It, it was one of those flights that we had to do valet check. And it was raining outside. So by the time I got my bag, it was soaking wet, you know. So And so the uh, cover got destroyed, but you're a very handsome picture. Yeah, which you carry with you at all times. I, I, I have that on my in my wallet. I have a, a copy of it. Carry my yeah, wallet. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, we're going to talk about the books. And uh, would it be safe to say that my book is um, very good toilet reading? Yeah. And the same can be said about mine. As a matter of fact, you know, there's, there's like 30 something chapters uh -huh. you know, off the rails, you know, and, and one of the things that I learned about writing a book, I, I, I took creative writing in college, I was a mass communication major, was that, uh, you know, about story arc. So one of the things that I wanted to do was that each chapter, it doesn't matter where, where you pick it up, there's a beginning, a middle and an end that leads to the next chapter. And then there's an overall arc to, to the story. So that's, a, I, I actually uh, story boarded with per chapter because, you know, un, unlike fiction, I had to stick to the facts. Right. And <laughs> the, facts are, the facts are crazy. I yeah. Mean, that's the one takeaway. I mean, I read your book, obviously. And the one takeaway is that every night was like, a nuclear explosion every night you didn't know what you were going to get if the gig was going to happen what was going to happen it was ozzy going to jump out of a window you know what i mean <laughs> kind of like that i mean literally i got that impression that that yeah. you would you would walk into a room and you just you didn't know what was going to happen i mean right absolutely you walk yeah <laughs> <laughs> I walked outside my door. I, mean, I did not know what was going to happen. As a matter of fact, I could be in my room and not know what was going to happen because I did, I did have my, my room stormed by, by Sharon and the crew in Rochester, New York, 1981. And uh, they, they threw me on the ground and there was the poor trash and the trash cans all over me. And Sort of an the, initiation, initiation, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. The I found out early uh, forty something years ago, English bands were really into tradition, and that was part of the tradition. Also, the tradition was that last night of the tour mayhem sure. that we happened within between the bands. I mean, uh, we did that with um, with uh, Iron Maiden uh, at the Opney Arena in Atlanta last night of the of, of the tour and then we were playing and they they uh, we were doing a uh, mental health and they, they started throwing eggs at us on stage as we were playing and shaving cream and all that then we ended the show took a shower got everything of us and then we 
we went in our underwear, and I'm talking about Speedos G-string stuff, you know, that you cannot even get anymore. Stuff, sure. Yeah, it's illegal to wear nowadays. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we went on stage with that and quite a riot mask. That's all we wore. Mm. And, and we created this mayhem because the, the guitar players were, were, were not wireless. They had cables. So they're trying to move around their, their rope crews like fishing their cable as they move around and so they're like they're like crossing each other so we waited for these moments there, there will be like a spider web on stage from all the guitar chords oh, and okay. then and then eddie comes out yeah you know you know in those days they had a guy in stilts the dressed mascot, like eddie right. yeah the mascot you know when that happened eddie we were running around the stage running around him and throwing things at the band with our speedos and and the choir riot mask and eddie got tangled in the guitar cables and fell over <laughs> you know who so. used to do that was ronnie <laughs> ronnie dio used to play mm. tricks on on his opening bands oh yeah um, oh yeah he nailed us really good on a couple of tours oh yeah uh I, I also ozzy and sharon uh if she if if sharon did not like a band and i'm not going to say what band she would put on the lead singer's microphone like like fart spray okay you know so like stink bomb fart spray right so when the singer went up to the first song <laughs> just to watch that i mean we knew what was going on we were on the side of the mm -hmm. stage and going like just watching the band pretending to be watching the band we're actually watching but it, the lead pretty, but it was pretty crazy i mean it was a different time, obviously, in the 80s and stuff. But Ozzy was in full Ozzy mode. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Because when I toured with him in 92, he had people around him. And he was, he was I want to say sober, but he was soberer <laughs> than he was back in your time. When he was snorting ants and, you know, doing that, that nutty shit every single night. So I didn't get to... The Aussie that I wanted. I wanted the Aussie you had. Oh. I, I, well, I, got I had dreamed about it. You know what I mean? I'm going to party with that guy, the Prince of Darkness. And it was something I was looking forward to. And then I would walk past his dressing room and Ozzy would be doing sit ups. And it was, it, it just, it blew my mind. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's not the guy. I don't want that guy. I want your guy. <laughs> you know. oh my god i mean i have never met anybody like like him or her i mean i think sharon and ozzy is like yin and yang you know they belong together mm -hmm. they apart, it just you know just breaks the whole circle you know and they complement each other beautifully <laughs> didn't you i mean at the time obviously you were a lot younger yeah. but it seems to me that when you're younger you're able to deal with this stuff in a different way the way you can you know what i mean i mean as you describe in your book a lot of the circumstances are just beyond belief i mean what you had to sort of deal with on a daily basis if you will you know not knowing what was going to happen and but but you just kind of rolled with it you know what i mean you had randy obviously at the same time and so he was sort of a I had Randy to help me navigate all the madness because he had been there already. And first thing he said, listen, don't take this personally. This is not about you. This is about who, what they're like, mm -hmm. as, as, as they're, how, how they did things, you know, their perception of how things should get done. Uh, but I got to tell you, if it wasn't because I had a spiritual center already, and I'm talking, I was 30 years old, you know, so it's about time I had a, a, a not just a spiritual center, but a, a, a focus. I wasn't wondering spiritually anymore after my experience right before I joined Ozzy, my epiphany. I was solid and I still remain, you know, the same spiritually. If, if, if it wasn't for that, I, I, first of all, I would have probably kept drinking with Ozzy because when I first joined the band, you know, let me put it this way, I survived all of the pitfalls of Hollywood, living in, you know, on the Sunset Strip. I survived, you know, not, not becoming a drug addict, not becoming an alcoholic, 
you know, I mean, somebody that drank every day. I mean, al alcoholism and me, it's a whole different subject that I'm not going to get into right now. But I am AA, you know, as, you, as we talked about that. And I understand that I am an alcoholic. But I'm talking about a practicing alcoholic. Somebody who's like says, "Okay, I'm an alcoholic." Right. Yes, I know. <laughs> but you were, gonna... you were only a journeyman back then. <laughs> then right. you achieved professional <laughs> status. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know, I Randy had been a in the band for a while, and Tommy, you know, she's not going to have asked Tommy to become Ozzy's drinking buddy. So I'm, I'm like, I'm the new, the new guy. So yeah. Oh, really? you know, they did say that to you. I remember you told me that that you were sort of um, told that you can't join in, that you have to, you know what I mean? Ozzy would ask you if you wanted something and you would say no. Ozzy would ask you if you wanted to do this and you would say no. And and it was it was it was important for for the band to be a band and function that everyone couldn't join in yeah hey, that was at the trial period you know once i got the I passed the audition randy on the way to to sharon's uh family home which is where where ozzy was staring staying at and then later on i stayed there for a long time uh randy said okay they're, they're gonna test you now test you mm -hmm. and so just make sure you say no to everything they offer not that I was going to do it anyways, but it was nice of Randy to make sure that I knew what was going on. Uh, see, I have no resume. You know, nowadays, if, you know, it's a whole different story. I've been doing this for 41 years. Before that, I was known as Randy's guitar player from Quiet Riot. Mm -hmm. That was my resume. So they, they, they have no reference. Who's this guy? So they only went on Randy's word that I was going to be the guy. Now they have to see it for themselves. And it was like... I have to prove that I am that I am not an addict in order to hang out with an addict, <laughs> which is not. Well, no, it's because like, you would make it you'd make it worse, or you know, quite possibly get fired. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And some people did get fired from because of that. But uh, so I'm I'm hanging out with with Ozzy and Sharon. You know, so Ozzy like <laughs> he would challenge me, and I'm thinking, well. You know, like like you said, that you'd rather be on tour with the that version of Ozzy. Yeah, that That's guy. the only version that I knew. I mean, I knew that this guy had been around for 15 years, which to him at the time seemed like an eternity uh, on tour uh, with Black Sabbath. And now he's back on the road. Uh, but with Randy, you know, his, 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 his version of the band with Randy Rhodes and Tommy Elders and myself. And he feels like it's been like, like it's, it's been too long. He's been doing this forever, you know. And 40 years later, he's still doing it because he just played live for some event with Tony Iommi. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's well, nuts. you know what? Let, let, I want to talk about something. Um, you and I kind of grew up in similar circumstances. And I want to say that, that you grew up on the Sunset Strip. Yeah, mm -hmm. before you were in Ozzy, you were in Quiet Riot. Mm -hmm. And you came out to Los Angeles from from Miami, from Florida, yeah, and yeah. struggled. And mm. there was years of struggle, just like me. Mm. You know, you were late seventies, I was late eighties, but we still went through that boot camp of uh, playing the strip. You know, playing gigs, flyering. You know, trying to get record companies to come see you. And at your point, when you were in Quiet Riot, New Wave was really big, you know, with K-Rock and stuff like that. And they just, the record companies kind of weren't interested in rock and roll and heavy rock and roll at that time, you know. So it was, but we both kind of went through that period of time, going to the rainbow, you know, living on people's floors, it, and and it, what that does is it builds your character. You know what I mean? It's like boot camp, you know, being in the army. And maybe talk a little bit about that when when back in that time. Yeah, building character. That's you know that's that's going to be an interesting uh, putting it together to deliver today. And, and and this is an answer 
that if you ask me the same question 10 years ago, I will probably give you a very different answer. I will give you a, a lower level answer or lower level if you're going into the quantum field. Oh, here, here we go. Here we here go. We go. Down, down the rabbit hole. Well, you know, th this is what happened. I arrived in 76 uh, and I, I, I ran out of money twice. 76, I ran out of money, went back out. I uh, did some, some touring in the Midwest, got some money, came back. 77, I came back. I ran out, but this is when, when I met Kevin, who remembered me when they were looking for a bass player. I met him at the Starwood. I had just seen Quiet Ryan. I told him, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And that same night, Dana Strum, his band was playing there. And he did the same thing. He approached Randy. Uh, I, I just told Kevin, I didn't approach him for any business reason, just like as a guy who happened to be in a club, sees a great band. And, and I, I run into anybody from the band and say, hey, man, that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, but I've seen I've seen a lot of videos. I, I, I've researched it and gone back because on YouTube, there's a lot of videos of you guys back then playing, um, playing the whiskey and playing yeah, some yeah. certain things. And it's and it's a different yeah. band. I mean, that mm -hmm. Quiet Riot musically mm -hmm. was different than obviously the, the Carlos Cavasso mm -hmm. the Quiet Riot. Most people know with Frank. Yeah. Yeah. stuff like that it was much it was pop it was more melodic and pop and then yeah. the other quiet riot the the one that eventually exploded yeah famous, but um yeah just, the, go ahead yeah there was there was an interesting transition happening musically uh see that quiet riot the 70 i joined in 78 was still very rooted in glam mm -hmm. Queen and and Mato Hoople and you know Steve Marriott as an influence for for Kevin's vocals and Bowie and and so on and in between that really really uh, new wave and punk overtook LA. As a matter of fact, we couldn't even play on the strip anymore. We started we started playing in the valley. <laughs> going out there to the country club you know places like that i remember and uh, you know yeah there was some some off nights that you would play at the whiskey i i did some shows with dubro around town and uh but it wasn't like all of a sudden it was like at the prime time prime time was devoted to the new wave bands and punk bands that were coming to la from out of town to showcase for the labels you know yeah i mean people it's been a while and, and 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 people don't really understand the impact that quiet riot had and i'm talking about when you guys broke yeah and and they say kick the door open yeah i mean yeah. you kicked the door open for rat and def leopard and great white and a lot of these other bands you know it was to be number one on billboard when that meant something i mean you can oh, go yeah. number one on Billboard now for selling a thousand records, but I mean back then, that was a huge thing. We went to number one when the competition was the biggest record in the, in the history of, of, of music sales. Sure. Like, you know, Thriller, Michael Jackson. I mean, that was our competition, and the Police, Synchronicity. Right, right, right. You know, that Do was. You remember? Uh, here's a funny story. Do you remember yeah, yeah. the exact day when you found out that you were number one? It's interesting about finding out that you're number one. Yes, I, we do. And it was basically business as usual because to become number one is the outcome of a lot of work that was done back. Now we're here and we're looking forward. So now we're looking at to becoming a bona fide headliner. And that was our goal. Right. Number one was the outcome of all this hard work. Now we're looking at the road that lays ahead, which was. But I mean, you know, it's still it's 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 mind blowing. It know? blows my mind now more than it did then because then I was too busy. Now you know, like what we do, like next year is gonna we're gonna we're going out to celebrate uh, forty years of mental health. Right. Now we look back and we we'll go, wow, that was huge. I can say that. Because now I'm looking at it from, from far away. I'm not in the hurricane. I'm not in the eye of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 
now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the event. Oh, wow, this, we did this four years ago. Hmm. Unbelievable. So, so you read my book. Yes. And what, yeah. were your, what was your take on it other than your singer is a little creepy? No, I mean, I, I love your creativity. I, I love your writing style. And also, one besides music, one of the things that we have in common is Rod Serling. Yeah, and Twilight Zone, sure. The Twilight, uh, the, not only the Twilight Zone movies, but I could not, I mean, TV shows, the series, but also I could not get enough of Rod Serling because we didn't have on demand streaming back in the day. Mm -hmm. So I started reading his books. He would publish books of stories that would not make it into a script mm -hmm. and that might not be suitable for TV at the time, you know. And uh, so I'm a huge fan. And so I started reading your, your book and I go like, oh, this is very much like the Rod Serling Twilight Zone collection well, of stories. Because we were both brought up with, yeah. with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. That half hour teleplay that that was like a, a morality play you know what i mean yeah. and, and and i like the irony at the end of some of his stories when he does those those surprise things you know yeah. it kind of pulls the rug out from under you a little bit yeah well i i i got to a point that i would watch the show just to see what the twist was going to be yeah so that, i'm expect it's got to be a twist here you know and then it's like usually the last 10 seconds a shock value and then it goes into no, a, I, a cigarette I, advertising yeah. i like that stuff and, uh, and yeah, of course yeah. you know i talk about the um uh, the autobiographical stuff yeah. you know the the stuff when i was a kid and growing up yeah. and whatnot and you know, i mean you know we're both kind of the same around the same yeah. age so so you would understand i mean but i guess living in the san fernando valley and 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 that the the marijuana culture back then is different from when it is now now it's just it's you know what i mean it was it was it was a simpler time in other words you know what i mean there wasn't cell phones there wasn't cable tv people actually got together and hung out and and they got stoned together but they just talked you know what i mean and listened to music you would put led zeppelin on or peter frampton or something like that and it was just, it was a communal thing it was a tribal thing back then it's just it's different times now what okay so you know i mentioned the q word quantum before okay. right okay now the what i got out of your book which is very different from mine and I, we mentioned by that that before is that the timeline of my book is based on one reality not alternate realities like your book. Your book is filled well, with that alternate moment realities. in time. Yeah, yeah, that moment in yeah. time. Yeah, this is what happened to us, or personally, this is what I experienced. This how, mm -hmm. that, that's how I would explain the book. These are my experiences, and I and I wrote them right. Now, your book, uh, where does creativity come from? Where, where do dreams come from? Mm -hmm. They come from alternate realities that are happening not only to us but to everybody else that we encounter, even people that we manifest. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm sure you've done this. I'm sure you manifested a, a bandmate, meaning that you wish you could play in a band with this individual. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, well, there it is. You know. We've been, I think I've I've been pretty lucky as as have you in in music. You've got mm -hmm, to play with mm -hmm. a lot of oh yeah amazing people. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to play in mm -hmm. White Snake during the the mm -hmm. the, the biggest yeah time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just mm -hmm. that was White Snake was the biggest band back then. I mean, they mm -hmm. were just huge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, there's many musicians that I actually uh, hope. To one day play with them or their level of musicianship and they they they're manifested somewhere along the line you know All right and uh or it may even coming back with to quiet riot i never think up a thought that i was going to be able to but i but i i i would I, it was a wish to yeah. come home yeah to be myself again to be my completely myself mm -hmm. and the only place i've ever been myself musically a thousand percent 
uh, what was a quiet riot because it was a collective consciousness. In no version of the ban initially was anybody really told what to do and how to do it. Mm. It was organic. You're either we either are organically uh, blend, right, or or, it's, or you're not going to be part. Yeah, of it. you don't know that. You don't know yeah. that till you actually get into yeah the arena and play together. Yeah. I mean, we've had it's been really fun for me. I and and we talked about this stuff in uh in airports at mm. 6 a.m waiting to <laughs> jump on another flight and stuff like that but it really has been a very positive uh experience mm. all of us playing together johnny mm. and alex mm. all of us you know a little bit of a resurgence in this mm. in this 40 year old mm. band and it's yeah. great i think yeah uh yeah, I and, and we talked about this, and uh, you know, we I, I expressed to you before, and I'll do it again. That what we're doing is actually expressing the the original consciousness of the band of Quiet Riot. You know, when I joined in 1978, and even the Metal Health version, as we were going up, up the uh, well, up the charts, up the but ladder. you know, up the ladder, you know, uh, it was all. It, it, it was only about the music. That was it. Nothing else. No religion. No politics. No 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 women getting in the way of it. You know at all. You know it was all focused on that. That's how you get to the top. There's no other way to do that. You know and you know there are other tops that right now I think places where Quiet Riot belongs. You know as a as a band in the marketplace mm -hmm. you know belongs uh, the, dude, with, with the room there you have icon the band has iconic songs i mean mm -hmm. my optometrist mm -hmm. can sing come on feel the noise mm -hmm. you know what i mean it, it's just there's you can't and and i this is coming from a guy that's been in a bunch of bands mm -hmm. and i know where other bands are and where their songs are and, and other bands have great songs you know what i mean other bands have great catalogs and stuff, but there's only a couple of bands that have stuff that's iconic. You know what mm. I mean? And and mm. and come on, feel the noise and bang your head. Mm. You know, you can talk all the shit you want, but those songs are they have a legacy that that goes beyond individuals. You know what I mean? It's it's bigger than the uh, the sum of the uh, individuals. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they represent a time and a place for each person that comes to our show. It means something different to them, but it means something. Well, it means it takes them back. It's, yeah. It takes them back to a, to a time when they were kids. And for some reason in their brain that releases a chemical that makes them feel like they're 16 or 17 years old again. And it's, it's, it's you know what I mean? And, and it's, uh, you can't that's something that you can't buy with facebook likes or instagram likes or anything like that it's just it's an organic thing that happens and i see it in people and i'm sure you see it too when we're up on stage and we kick into certain songs it, people light up yeah well it's really interesting and, and i was going to mention this and make a comparison but then i corrected myself uh because I was going to tell you, yeah, you know, when most of our audience, when they were teenagers, when the song came out, it, they were simpler times. And then it hit me, you know, just the, the vision of looking at a video that my wife made of one of the shows that we did at the fair. I think it was Paso Robles. She came and she videoed these teenagers. Yeah into it as much as a teenager 40 years ago got into you know come and feel the noise or bang your head or whatever and she was filming it and i'm thinking wait a minute okay if i'm going to blame technology or you know or all the things that distract us and distract society nowadays i can't do that because these kids have that distraction and they're still be resonating with the music well, we we tap into it for some yeah. weird yeah. reason. No, I see it. I, I mean, when I see young girls 
screaming and going crazy for for guys in their you know later years i just it it it, it it's it's it it's pretty amazing you know what i mean it's yeah. amazing. and it's the music and it's what we do on stage you know what i mean we have a, a good yeah. energy i mean you know when you're up there being you it's you have a visual presence and people vibe on it if this could have, this one might make you feel better and look at it from a different point of view from from this moment on okay our odd atoms the atoms in, your, in our body that makes us you and me are just as old as those teenagers atoms okay I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm with you and, and we're it, made, we're made out of the same atoms as the rest of the universe. We are stardust. Uh, you know where that comes from? We are stardust. We are, we're made out of the same, this, this book is made out of the same atoms as you no, and I, I get, I, no, yeah. I, I get you. Yeah. That you yeah. Your, your, your quantum, it's physics. Yeah. Your, 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 yeah. Your... And scientifically it's proven that you, you cannot destroy energy. You don't, right? So that energy has been there since what is considered the Big Bang. Certain scientists are going beyond that. They're destroying this whole Big Bang theory. It's just mm -hmm. basically consciousness, but that's a whole different conversation. So when you look at a, a young person, it just means that their, their structure, their atomic structure, have been rearranged mm -hmm. later than ours. It's a different, well, we're, we're on a different timeline, but what makes us who we are is the same, the same substance, the same atoms, and they're ageless. They're timeless. All I care, timeless. All I care about yeah. is that chick, chicks dig it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they it. dig it, because we are, what we do is we create frequencies, right? And when, and it stems from, from, from us, from the heart, and it comes out in our music through our instruments, well, that's through what the I'm microphone, saying. everything, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We have a, you know, it's all about the music. It. It's all about the music, nothing else. Yeah. We're, we're not, not thinking we're not about wondering. it. We're thinking about. Yeah. Who's getting more songwriting royalties and, and, and who's banging who's a girlfriend and, and all that stupid shit from the past no you know that shit breaks up bands that's 20 year old stuff that's kid stuff you know what i mean and we are basically focused on the music because you have to be i mean to be able to to do what we do and travel the way we travel it's it's not for everyone you know what i mean and it's not easy and everyone goes oh you have the best job in the world well the music part is the best job in the world you know what i mean but it's getting to iowa and back and getting up at 2 30 in the morning you know what i mean and it's the stuff that you know people don't see that we we have to do to to get to the gig and to get to the church on time you know what i mean and you have a very zen i say this to people you have a very zen quality to you and it and it does help the vibe you know what I mean? Of 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 the, the the energy. Here's my secret. Okay, I'm waiting. Okay, okay, have you, okay. Have you ever worked on making a video? A video, you know, like a like a like a like a video where you take different edits of different scenes, you put yeah, them together. Only, yeah, every other week. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. There's certain scenes that you do not do not want on that timeline. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You delete them. Yes. Right? And you replace them with the ones that you want. Okay. That's life. Yeah. But you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I, think, I think that I'm working on you and I'm chipping away and you're getting a little saltier uh, week by week by week. And, and so pretty soon there may come yes. a day <laughs> yes you may, when you're going to say F that guy <laughs> yeah no no not because today but because uh, I, i'm only human and i also i am aware of modeling modeling is a technique where you sit across from somebody and you mm -hmm. try to model everything about them 
right? Their, even their body language, the, the subject, what they're saying, mm -hmm. right? Because it brings us together. It breaks down barriers completely. We're one. We have to, once in a while, I would model one of you guys just so we're even closer. Well, you know, like taking dough, you know, sometimes you take, unless you go like this to the dough, it ain't going to turn into a, a cake. It might turn into something very strange, like the egg will be here and mm -hmm. whatever, the oil will be separated. You have to like knead, knead. Okay. Well, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because actually, you know, we didn't get to, to talk about your book on the road because you, we've been saving it for the show, for your show. Okay. You know, so uh, now that we're on the subject of your book, you know, like I mentioned before, it's very, um, it's kind of like a, co a collective, a collective of your, <laughs> and I'm going to go, it's a combination of altered realities because you write up, sometimes you use pseudonames, mm -hmm. names that the average human might not be associate you with the name, but you're actually writing about things you have experienced. But but it's it's about personal experiences that you've had. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that are definitely alternate realities that we tap you tap with your creative antenna or Wi-Fi, you know, whatever we use nowadays to come up with, with that with shit that mm -hmm. we don't even know where that's coming from, but it's coming. It's in there. It's do, coming you have any, do you have any particular stories? That, that yeah. Sort of... You know, being Latino, I am very aware of the whole, you know, the, the Maya, Aztec, Inca. Oh, you like that? Civilization. One. I really like that one because it's kind of like without really having been there in this, in, in this form, Rudy, and back in, you know, what, 500, 600 years ago, yeah. you know, during the time of uh, Cortez or whoever, right. Mon, Mon, you know, Montezuma 15, and all 15, that. 1519 is when yeah. Cortez. Yeah. Hernando and... Cortez. Yeah. Uh, prior to that, they were still practicing it. You know, all of that. Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. And it's really interesting because of all of the pyramid-shaped cultures, cultures with pyramids, I think they're the only ones that actually did human sacrifice. I'm not sure. The, 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 the story basically is <clears throat> everyone knows that the Aztecs mm. used to uh, sacrifice mm. people. And what they did is they would do these battles, and they didn't do the battles to to kill each other, they would battle other tribes to collect prisoners. Mm. Each culture would collect their prisoners, and the prisoners would be sacrificed mm. to the, uh, the the god to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was mm. basically mm. we need to keep hold the hearts out with the obsidian knives. I mean, everyone's familiar with that imagery, but mm -hmm. the whole story is these two guys that are helping the priest do this, hold the people down, clean up, blah, blah, blah. What's going through their heads? They're just, this is their job. They're not, they're not religious. That's just, this is what they do for a living. And, and so the conversation of what would go between, that was sort of inspired me to write the story. Just what would be the conversation of these two working guys that this was their job and how weird and how it's just normal for them to, you know, clean up livers and intestines and stuff like that. And you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that it, it was so well written because I could really relate that to, let's say we play a festival and I always look at all the latrines, all those, uh, yeah, what yeah, do you call porta potties. Porta potties. And I'm thinking, wow. Who's going to clean up this mess? There's it, a guy. There's a guy that does that. <laughs> you know, and God bless that guy because if otherwise we couldn't play if there's yeah. no porta potties, you know. So thank you, Mr. Porta Potty uh, Cleaner.
and uh, but it's not necessarily the most glamorous job, but it is part of the entertainment industry. All that stuff is the caterers, yes, catering, the people yeah. that get there at five in the morning mm -hmm. and have to set up the stage mm -hmm. and they don't go to bed till 11 or 12 at night. There's a lot of, I, I talked about it in one of my videos about like, for example, the Skid Row tour that we just um, mm -hmm. are in the middle of doing yeah. where the roadies basically work all day. Mm -hmm. They get there in the morning mm -hmm. and they, they don't stop working until 11 or midnight or one o'clock. And that's and uh, and on this tour they're flying everywhere which means that in you know traditionally let's say a rigger the guy who goes out there and sets up the you know everything that's going to be flown uh he gets he's the first one out of the bus he goes up there sets all the points and then he's done until the show ends and everything's packed away and then the last thing is you remove those points but meanwhile, he's been asleep, hopefully, yeah. in a tour bus, resting. Yeah, no, they, they they work, their work schedule is completely different from, say, ours. Ours, I mean, we have to kick ass and do what we do on stage, but we don't have to literally lift and, and push. And it's just, it's, it's a lot of work behind mm -hmm. the scenes that people don't see, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? that yeah. people don't see. Absolutely, absolutely. And God, God bless each one of them. The people that parked the cars. If there was no no people parking cars. Thank you, Mr. Car Parker. Mr. Car Whatever. Parker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, you other, tell <laughs> what other story caught your fancy? Okay. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of personal stuff, like you talking about what it's really, you know, the reality, especially for a band in the 90s, who was still in the Sunset Strip when you have, when now the record companies are focusing on the Seattle scene, mm. you know, all the alternative. If, if there's a band in, in, in Omaha, Nebraska, they're going to check it out because it's not L.A. <laughs> Anything well, but was, L.A. <laughs> how it was instantly uncool to yeah. be a Sunset Strip yeah. band after 1992 yes. which which is not that different from being instantly uncool from being a, ba a band in 1978 right after van halen sure. got signed they were the last ones they shut the door after that and they had no competition mm -hmm. yeah because you're not it. thomas because you're not thomas dolby or something like that <laughs> no i guess as a matter of fact as a matter of fact it was great because then, you know, Roth could go around saying, well, you know, uh, journalists like Elvis Costello because they look like one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, pearls of wisdom coming from David Lee Roth. He was, he was basically the last spoke person for the 70s rock generation because he was doing all the interviews. <laughs> I used to see him um, when I was a kid. He would come to the Troubadour sometimes. And it was just, you'd see him and you would just, you would freeze because he was David. And that's when he was David Lee Roth, not yeah. the guy now. The guy now is not kind of a caricature of, of, but back then, I mean, he was the biggest rock star on the planet. And I'd see him, he would go into the Troubadour bathroom and, and stay in there for a half hour and do coke. And then he'd come out and you just, you know what I mean? You didn't know how to act around him because he was he was you know one of the gods of mount olympus and you were yeah. just a yeah. little kid with a sammy yeah. hagar t-shirt <laughs> yeah know? yeah one time we did a show quiet riot with randy and the band uh and this is in the 70s they had just he was hanging out with david forrest you remember david forrest he ran the starwood that oh you, you might have been too young back then okay. the, the guy with the glasses no, David Forrest, he, he, uh, he had fun productions. He was also, yeah, he managed Quiet Riot for a little bit. A lot of the bands that wanted to play at the Starwood, he had this thing that if you, if he managed you, then you could play at the Starwood oh, okay. type of a deal. And then, you know, he tried to get record deals and bring in uh, certain managers, like uh, what was the guy that used to manage, uh, he's passed on, uh, Kiss and Billy Idol. Anyway. Wow. 
you know, the, he, he brought him to, to come and see Quiet Riot and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it was pretty grim. So if anybody would show any interest in your career, you would pay attention mm-hmm. and, 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 and try to trust this individual because you, you don't know them, right. but they're trying to help you. You know, so, you, you know, what you guys went through with Love, Love Hate, but you guys got signed, which Quiet Riot with Randy never got signed. That, right. that's, that's the major well, difference. Well, it, it wasn't meant to be. We've talked about how fate and destiny mm-hmm. play a role mm-hmm. in, in a person's career. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You do make your own luck. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You work your ass off and you make your own luck, but you still have to have luck. I mean, there, there were a lot of talented musicians in Hollywood and really good bands, but they never made it. You know what I mean? Maybe they, but they didn't have whatever that magic dust of, of destiny. You know, um, I wish that you would have, when I read your book, I wanted to hear, and we've talked about this, about how, how the whole Quiet Riot experience is a whole nother book. You know what I mean? Because I, I just, you know, because what you did and what you experienced in that kind of 82, 83 period, most people will never, ever get to, you know, they'll never know what that's like that meteoric rise you know what i'm saying well if we keep doing what we're doing you'll get to experience it too <laughs> no, no. i don't know about that but i mean you know what i'm saying it, it's just oh, it's, yeah. I, I i i wanted to 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 get a little bit of that and and, and you've talked about it i mean we've talked privately and stuff like that but it, it's just something that that most people most people will never get a record deal most people will never get to tour and open up for huge bands, you know what I mean, mm. in their lives and play big places and, and and know that grandeur of being on a production and being on a bus and yeah. and all that stuff. That yeah. It's like when you it's like being a professional baseball player, you know what I mean? Being on TV, playing in the stadium. I mean, most people will never get to experience that bit of the music business you know there's actually a recipe and i use the recipe is because you have to have certain ingredients available mm-hmm. to create whatever dish you know the dish of success there's, there's well, a recipe to it there's a hard recipe. work hard work is oh, one that that is one you know uh there's there's definitely a, a list of ingredients and what happens is, see, when I experienced that with Quiet Riot, and this this is a question that you raised that had made me look into it as to why I, I, what you're telling me, yes, I get it. But while I was experiencing it, I wasn't feeling it like you were for the first time. Mm-hmm. Because I had the year before, or two years before that, I experienced that with Ozzy. Right. See, Ozzy, yeah. Ozzy got to experience, and I'm talking warp speed. Black Sabbath, it took them a while to get to the right. top. You know, with with Ozzy, it was like, okay, we did one, and this is when I joined the band. They had already done some touring with Bob Basley and Lee Kerslake in the UK, but I'm talking specifically the US, which is what, what Sharon wanted to capture, that US audience, which is massive. You know, and we started with Blizzard of Oz doing theaters, and, and it was kind of like word of mouth, mainly about you know that Ozzy's back and he's got this guitar player named Randy Rhodes, and then they will buy the record to back it up. Yeah, it's a great record. Yeah, it's solid. He, it's the same thing, the same Randy on record as it is on stage, right? Mm-hmm. Then we had this 100 mile limit. Uh, rule, which meant that you could promote, you could book gigs within 100 miles. Mm-hmm. So you're playing in Philadelphia today, and then you play 100 miles away from Philadelphia, in Newark. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the routing was really tight, which meant that we will only tour, we would do like Northeast, uh, Southeast, Midwest, you know, Central Midwest, nor- Northern Midwest, you know, areas like that, which means that if you're in Philadelphia, and you really love what you saw, well, you might drive those few hours to go well, and catch us in Newark. 
and it 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 allowed for word of mouth yes absolutely you know yeah I mean? exactly yeah and that's exactly what happened it was like man you're gonna believe this ozzy man he's got this guitar player randy rose mm -hmm. you gotta go and see him and then, you know these were the musicians right so that's what's still building up it started building up not really slowly but it was kind of like uh what do you call that uh when you you go from two to four to eight uh oh, to 16 oh, geometric ex exponentially exponentially mm -hmm. yeah okay so it built up like that and it was like just to witness that on stage looking up like wow look at tonight look at all these musos in mm -hmm. front of randy but then some girls start showing up when the flipper we went we went, from, we went from motorhead opening which was like you know you got one guy from black sabbath and motorhead right. on the show I mean, that's on the bill. Now, what you get to witness is actually Randy Rhodes playing mm -hmm. all these all these music live. And of course, by a but then with Def Leppard, the chick started to. Yes. I mean, and that was the, it was not just a shift. As many guys showed up and now you add the women. Mm -hmm. That doubles the capacity. Now people, it's like instead of 5,000 people coming, there's 10,000 people coming to our shows. You know, and mm -hmm. that's how the arena version of the band got built up uh during the uh, the blizzard of us tour then sharon made a very bold decision to do that massive castle touring you know and i gotta tell you uh, we only took one month off i believe that was like late september to to october then we started touring opening up for saxon in in the in germany in europe and which led to the beginning of the Diary of a Madman headlining tour, but starting out in the UK with a uh, with Girl as the opening band. Right, right, right. Uh, with uh, Phil Collins and Philip Lewis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so then immediately we went over to the United States and started touring with Diary, and then Randy passed on in March 19th. But I got to tell you that see, I have more of an impression mm -hmm. of how, that happenings like wow you know this is like growing blowing mm -hmm. up you know once i went on tour with quiet riot and it was like okay we got these elements not exactly not exactly the same ingredient but equivalents you know and it started to explode and what really made the difference was mtv ozzy did not have sure. the mtv exposure uh you know that quiet riot did that that was the that that's that and if you can put MTV and Metal Health together, as as that that's what opened the doors. It, well, it, it, you were it was right place, right time. There yeah, there was a lot. I mean, there was luck and with the right mean, song, with the right and, song, with the right band. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So when when that happened with Quiet Riot, it was I saw it pretty much as a continuation of what I had been doing with Ozzy. It's oh, like, I've seen yeah. this, I've seen this, I've experienced this. So oh, it really yeah. didn't have that much of the impact. It was more like, okay, there's a blueprint. Let's do what, what we did with Ozzy. Mm -hmm. Let's, but of course, now that you got MTV into it and it was different dynamics, but still the road remained the same and the outcome was the same. Now, I remember, I remember the first time I heard my song on the radio. I mean, I, rem I remember the exact moment driving to rehearsal and hearing it on a, a you know, the, the the big metal station in LA, it, it escapes me. Okay, your voice came, ET. Uh, no, the 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 newer one. KNAC, the NAC. Can't, can't yeah, see. I don't know why. That, anyway, yeah. I brain farted, but I remember hearing it, and it was yeah. just it was unbelievable. It was just weird. It was, I actually yelled, as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause it's just, it's, it's a milestone. Yeah. In like the first time you play an arena, like the first time, you know what I mean? You meet someone that's your idol. Like when, when, when I met Brian May a queen, you know, I just, I stood there stuttering like a, like an idiot. I mean, it's just that kind of stuff goes into the memory banks and um, all those life experiences. That's, that's what I get out of music. His life experience. Yeah, I mean, this band even, I mean, you know, uh, separately, I mean, because uh, I, I, I can't help it, but I, I have to include Randy 
in this whole thing about you know the the importance and the, and the legacy of the band i i have to i have to even though even though most people remember randy from ozzy then quiet riot of course sure. uh that collective consciousness that we had you know with, with uh, in the 70s you know that there was a foundation to that and a lot of it had to do with randy being a responsible musician mm -hmm. uh his family owns a music school mm -hmm. so he comes from that environment of like you play you practice you go through an academic course you study certain things you know and, if, and it's you're going to get out of it as much time as you put into it and of course he had an, a, an exceptional outstanding talent right for composing and performing and so on but still there, there was it, there, there was a, there was a structure in his life you know to a certain consciousness of being the best you could ever be school you you go to school because you want to be the best that you can be right as, and learn well schools are open to bring this consciousness into this belief system into these walls and 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 there's going to be a teacher there there's going to be make sure that this is what you experience and i experienced that when, when i was teaching at the school i learned how to teach from randy because mm -hmm. I, I was at a loss i never taught before well there's, so, the, there's the randy era there's mm -hmm the big era with yeah. you and Carlos and Frankie. Yeah. And then there's the post, you know? Yes. I mean? yes. Yeah. There's different eras to this band. Like there's different eras mm -hmm. to the band Chicago. You know yes, I mean? absolutely. There's the absolutely. early version. There's the, the, the pop version and there's mm -hmm. the modern version now. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned something very, very important, which is what I, I respect and I love and I want to celebrate along with, with, with you and Johnny and Alex, the legacy and the consciousness again, because we, we shared this, you are from the strip. You come from the same consciousness that Quiet Riot comes from. This is why it's, it's such a joy to go on stage with you because we bid, we walk the same sidewalks as, as starving musicians and we try to steal the same little cinnamon buns at, at the rainbow from the baskets of the, of the table you know we've been there you know we get it uh and then the fact that johnny w w was picked by by frankie you know and then both you know free being from the east coast they play like you know they have that new york well, style and alex play, has been in know. the band 20 years yeah and alex you know i, I was going to get to alex you know alex is you know, he was there even before Frankie returned when went to play with Kevin. And then that's when that, you know, that started the the late, you know, that version of a quiet ride in 2004 or five, you know. And so Alex has been there all, all along, you know, and so it's it's everybody gets it. But I think we are on a on a frequency right now that is it's it's just like the same frequency of that we had when we hit the stage 40 45 years ago including with randy you know it, it might have been really pop because that's that's what quiet riot what music was at that time and then it became heavier more of that acdc blueprint you know that everybody right. from Beth leopard to everybody else was using including quiet riot in the 80s and now you know we're we're being ourselves which is the one well, thing that that, that, without, that we yeah. talked about we're having fun yeah. Fun, fun to me is is the, at the very top of what we do, uh, you know. But it's head banging, it's serious fun, it's heavy fun, heavy, heavy. Go like you were talking about, but it's fun, yeah. But it's fun. It's like, for example, watching Mick Jagger. Now, for me, being a performer, who actually we get up on stage, I, I slick black Cadillac. I played up with Randy in 1978. That's almost 45 years ago, right? So there's a bit of timelessness where when I'm playing that song, it's not now, it's not then, it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. I'm caught in that moment that I'm actually playing the same song. And the more, and this is something that is, is incredible, the, the, again, the attitude 
that this band plays in how reminiscent it is of the original attitude. Mm-hmm. There's a, in, <laughs> you know, in, in the seventies, you couldn't help it, but feel the energy of punk music in LA, in the bands. You might not be, a, you might not own a punk record, but you were playing the same clubs that the punk bands. You had to adopt that sense of, of danger mm-hmm. when you play. <laughs> no matter how great the musicians are, it, it, you're not shooting for perfect, you're shooting for magic. Right. What can I do today that is like so magical that we're going to get it as a band, we're going to feel that, and then the audience is going to feel it too. Well, I'm going to end this now, my son. I very think good. it's been very informative. And people got to, we've talked a little bit about our books. People can get your book. Um, do you got a website or how, how do people get it? How do people get your book? My book available on Amazon. You just go to the page uh, uh, off the rails on, on, yeah, it's just off the rails. Rudy Sarzo okay. off the rails. They can download a Kindle or they yeah. can just uh, buy buy the print copy. Well, and 12, it's very, it's very yeah. interesting. Like I said, it's, it's a moment mm-hmm. in time mm-hmm. that it, when I'm reading it, I'm just thinking to myself, oh my God, how did you, how did you get through the day? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So it's pretty, it's cool. pretty much like and everyone, that. <laughs> and everyone can get my book at my website, and I'll I'll put up the little thing, and and uh, and we're playing every single weekend for the foreseeable future. We're playing Monsters on the Mountain this weekend. We're playing Rocklahoma, I think, the week after that, and um, on to bigger and better gigs. That's right, bigger, bigger. I mean, it's you know basically you know. Let's put Quiet Riot back where it belongs. You know? Yeah. Oh, I'm all for and, it. Dude. And have fun doing it. Yeah. <laughs>